I thought that the US was a, you know, save us from terrorism, etc., etc. And what I've actually found out is that the US government is a terrorist organisation. Julian Assange being the first political refugee <coughs> in Australia in, in, in history, cooped up in a very small embassy in, in London. In, has, is that affecting him at all about his determination to continue? I think it's making him more determined actually. It's affecting him physically because he's a person who really loves freedom. So that's him making him more determined not actually. Able to be it's affecting free. him physically I mean, enough, as a person who is being wild and free in another way, and I don't think the American government expected some of the stuff to be coming out of the Ecuadorian embassy that's been coming out. Um, and he's very much um, emboldened, of course, by the support he has from ordinary people all around the world and, of course, Ecuador. It, in fact, this case of his that was initiated by Sweden as it's going through the corridors of, 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 of um, the legal establishment and the um, various parliaments that have been involved in supporting this persecution of Julian, it's, it's exposing things, like a wheel rolling through, it's throwing the doors open and exposing even more. So WikiLeaks did one lot of exposures, the reactions of the people in power are exposing even more. and. Locking him up in this embassy is just drawing attention. That is, that the UK and the and Sweden and the uh, Australian governments are just nothing more than lackeys of the US. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I did want to ask about Australia as well because Julie Gillard infamously um, said that WikiLeaks had, had done something illegal by the Cablegate release. Infamous because of his, his role, Sanj and WikiLeaks has broken no Australian rules. And also, Bob Carr has, has continually argued that Julian Assange has got the fullest possible consular assistance. Um, mm. and, that's, and he's said that he's got the same help that any Australian who's in trouble would get. Well, that's a bit of a worry. You wouldn't want to be Australian in trouble overseas, then, would you? <laughs> What does it say? What does it say about Australia's relationship with the United States? We're a puppet government. I mean, I, when I started this adventure two years ago to support my son, I had no idea what I was going to find out. I thought the US was, um, unlike perhaps many of you, I was more naive. I thought that the US was, a, you know, save us from terrorism, etc., etc. And what I've actually found out is that the US government is a terrorist organisation. Yeah. And I'm absolutely disgusted with our government. You know, they've got corns on their belly, they've been crawling for so long. I asked um, the lawyers in London, and I asked the WikiLeaks staff, and I asked Julian, what sort of consular assistance have you had? So I asked everybody. And they said the only thing we've had since December 2010 is then booking seats at the court and scribbling madly and scurrying back to wherever they scurry back to to report. They don't even acknowledge Julian's presence. Consular assistance is not what's needed here. It's diplomatic protection. This is not an ordinary case. Julian's lawyers put us to 16 different things from the Australian government and were knocked back for all 16. Commentators have been calling for, for Julian to be assassinated and killed and garroted, etc, etc, as is their way of dealing with things. And Julian's lawyers asked, could you please ask them to retract those statements? The Australian government wouldn't even ask. Ah. Um, they, Julian's lawyers asked the Swedish government to, to desist from making defamatory and untrue statements in the media about Julian's uh, court case, thus producing his right to a fair trial. They wouldn't even ask. Uh, the most scary one for me, there were two. One is that on the conclusion of the case in Sweden, could they guarantee his safe passage back home? 
um, so that he wouldn't be yanked off the plane by a bunch of CIA agents head to head for a black site somewhere. And they wouldn't even ask for that. And the last one was if he found himself in a US prison, um, could they please ask the American government not to put him under special administrative measures, <coughs> which is a nice word for torture. And they put people, prisoners under special administrative measures uh, when they want to torture them, but they don't want to call it torture. And they say that the prisoner is a danger to himself. They did that with Bradley Manning against the express wishes of his psychiatrist. The Australian government wouldn't even ask the American government not to torture my son. You went to Ecuador, and there's been a lot of interest in Ecuador because of the, the role which they played in granting um, political asylum to Julian Assange. So tell us a little bit about your impressions of Ecuador and the people you met and, and what you think of the, the citizens' revolution which is underway there. It was absolutely fabulous. I, I wasn't expecting it. Um, I don't know what to expect, just what the mainstream media told. You know, I picked up the mainstream media that, you know, they're a third world country and it's dangerous and they're full of dangerous revolutionaries. And, well, they certainly are. They're dangerous to the US. Um, because Ecuador actually is a working participatory democracy. This country has 80% support of its people after five years in government. Um, it has a 7.8% growth rate and yet it is based on human rights in the constitution. It's based on sovereignty, um, sustainability and protection for the environment. And these are all the things that we want, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. And yet we're told, nah, that'll never work, get real, no, that won't work. Well, Ecuador is doing better than the US economically in that sense that it's got a growth rate, it's got its own sovereignty, it's reducing its foreign debt. Um, and it certainly leads the US in regards to human rights. Um, and I felt that from the people. It wasn't just from the ministers, it was also from the people. People would come up to me in the street, nuns, bellboys, whatever. Solidarity with you, Mrs. Assange. I had an old nun come up to me in Cuenco. She would have been about 85. Solidarity with you, Mrs. Assange. It was just wonderful. Their constitution is amazing. Um, there's been a lot of um, damning of them in the media, of course, once. Ecuador decided to give Julian um, uh, asylum, of course, they turned the guns on Ecuador. Uh, you know, they've got a terrible media record, etc. Well, actually, in the Constitution, which we could adopt here, there's protection for free media. Um, it's split three ways. 30% public, 30% community, 30% private, and you cannot own a media outlet if you have interest in any other business. Um, they've got special legislation for the environment called Pachamama, um, enshrining the rights of nature separate to the rights of people. In other words, nature is not just here for us to use, they have rights of their own. And I think that anyone who is interested in reforming this situation we've got in Australia where we do not have participatory democracy. We've got career politicians that are puppets. Go and look at Ecuador. And they took back their oil licenses, they, they cancelled some of their foreign debt um, and they're looking after their people and they've got, eight, they've got the second in the world highest support for the government after five years in government and that's despite the fact that the CIA is trying to bring them down. One of the things that Julian Assange has said about the media, he, he gave a recorded video address to the Splendour in the Grass concert. He said that our generation is burning the mass media to the ground. The mainstream media, their response to WikiLeaks has been hostile. So I wanted to ask, why, why do you think they've been so hostile to WikiLeaks, who has had so many more scoops than that they've produced? Well, that might be one of the problems, the old green-eyed monster, I think, might be part of it. 
these big media uh, organisations are owned by the same people that WikiLeaks is out in. General Electric, Goldman Sachs, Halliburton, JP Morgan. So that would be one of the one of the reasons. The other one is is jealousy. I think there's a lot of jealousy and I've been told that by the good journalists. I have noticed that the really top journalists like Anthony Lowenstein <laughs> they all support WikiLeaks. It's the ones that aren't really the good journalists, the ones that would like to be well known but don't want to do the hard work and don't want to stick their necks out. Absolutely useless. I've got to give Green Left a bit of a plug here because the print journalists from all around the world, the one who has been most keen to print the facts has been these guys. Uh, not only were they courteous to me when interviewing me, but were very keen to get the facts right, and they showed a lot of braveness in, in not holding back, and they, they didn't cut the juicy bits out, in other words. So I think Green Left needs a great big hand. <laughs> And that's why I'm here tonight, actually, to support them. That's why I've come here tonight. I actually haven't come here tonight as, a, as something for Julian. I've come here tonight to support Greenleaf because without this little paper, with the big heart and lots of guts, Australian people don't know what's going on. And not only Australian people, other people around the world don't know what's going on because you, you've got global reach. In one of the interviews with you, you described how you reacted as any mother would to begin with, but then you went and read the cables and it really changed the way you, you thought about, about the world. But are there any cables or any WikiLeaks releases which, which really made a big impact to you and if still stay with you? God, definitely. First of all, when I found out why Bradley Manning did what he did, the last draw for him, he was asked to take um, 15 Iraqi civilian dissidents to the Iraqi police for torture. And their big crime was running around with a piece of paper that said, where's the money gone? And that was about the reconstruction rorting, which happens after, after wars, especially with US contractors. And when he objected, he was told to shut up and go and get 15 more. The next one was Haiti, <clears throat> one of the poorest countries in the world. And it had the big earthquake. And people poured money in from all over the world. But the US government decided, oh goody, we can use it. So at that time, the president of Haiti was trying to get the minimum wage uh, brought up for his clothing workers, or 26,000 of them working for brands like Haynes and Levi Strauss. They were in poverty conditions and he wanted to raise the minimum wage. It was only a matter of 30 cents or something an hour. And the American government said, well, if you want to do that, you can forget about any aid for your earthquake. Now, I'm no politician, but that sounds like blackmail to me. Um, Venezuela stepped in to help by offering to get them cheaper oil, take 40% off the price so that they could build their hospitals and schools, and Chevron and the others moved in and blockaded that. And the last part of that cable was the US contractors who were, had been found doubling their quotes at Katrina and Rorting. And the cable said the gold rush is on. It's not only do they make money out of all the weapons they use, but post-disaster post and post-war, then they make a whole lot more money out of Rorting in the reconstruction. And a lot of the aid money that goes in from everybody around the world goes to these people. So they just win, win, win every way it goes. You know, there's always a bit of money for them somewhere. Um, back closer to home, two cables stood out. One's an environmental cable, 2007. 
the Howard government had legislated to protect the Barrier Reef by um, saying that any big boats that went through the, the Torres Strait had to call the mainland to get a pilot boat to go through yeah, so that to avert um, an oil spill or a gas spill, chemical spill. The US wasn't happy with that. It wanted to take that legislation away, but they resisted. When this current Labor government got in, they tried again. And the cable, it's really fascinating. If you haven't looked at these cables, go and have a look at them. It's to, to see it actually written down, the way these people talk to each other is a real eye opener. So it goes something like this. Mm, we'd really like to help you, but if we took away the legislation and there was an oil spill, the Australian people would never forgive us. Not, oh dear, there might be a spill on the reef and damage our beautiful reef, but we might get caught out, right? Um, and then it goes along, never mind, that's all right, we thought of a solution. When your boats go through, in other words, the US boats go through, if you get caught, we won't issue a penalty. All right, that's our government, right? And of course, we all know about the cables about Mark Habib and Julia Gillard. I, I decided to take over at the last minute. The 10th of June, 2009, a cable talking in depth about how Gillard was being groomed to take over. Gillard, this is a direct quote, Gillard knows that to become Prime Minister, she must move to the right and support the US alliance and Israel. And then it goes on how she's doing so well, going to plan. But they're the ones that really affected me. I didn't need to move any more than that. I, I, I didn't come out and support Julian because he's my son. I supported Julian's right to a fair trial over the Swedish stuff, okay? But I didn't come out publicly and support WikiLeaks until I was assured that it was a good and useful thing in the world. And I'd read enough cables to know that, and they're still coming up. We've got spy files, it's strapped for emails, and it just keeps going on and on. Uh, please, please say Christine Assange. Thank you.